Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. This is Scott King. Uh, I'm CTO here at Mobius Partners. Uh, before we get started on uh, today's topic, just wanted to cover off on a few logistics here. Uh, we've joined forces here today with uh, the Phosphorus team uh, to deliver on on, uh, on the subject of you know, IoT security and you know, challenges that we faced and, and what we can do about those challenges. Uh, we're super excited about having an extra special guest for us to hear Chris Rulin, a CEO and founder of Phosphorus. So uh, uh, excited about getting into today's discussion. Uh, before we get started, uh, you'll, we'll be providing uh, some brief company overviews of our two companies, and then we'll uh, uh, you know, get into the content, of course, uh, and we'll have you know, some discussion portion of that content, as well as a, a product demo from the Phosphorus team. So uh, once again, uh, looking forward to, to seeing that and, and getting into the dialogue here. We've allocated 10 minutes at the end of uh, today's session for questions and answers. Um, please submit those questions in the chat window. We'll be sure to get them at, you know, answered at the end of the call during that uh, portion of the webinar. Uh, all the listeners on the call today will be entered into a drawing uh, to win a free IoT security assessment, and we'll be following up with the winner, you know, of the assessment in the coming days. So with that, let's get started. Uh, 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 just a little bit of, you know, dialogue on topic for today's session. You know, wanted to bring some awareness to the challenges we're all facing you know, when it comes to securing the high volumes of I I IoT devices in our networks. Uh, think about all the endpoints that we have in our environments today. You know, the, the list just goes on and on and on. You know, printers, cameras, projectors, card readers, TVs, vacuums, smart devices, you know, OT use cases and manufacturing plants, refineries, uh, and the like. Uh, pretty much anything connected to the network is, you know, uh, susceptible to some of the challenges that we're all facing today. Uh, so uh, uh, with that, you know, uh, that's, that's what we wanted to bring to you. It's a hot topic for many folks. Uh, we're getting a lot of traction with our, with our customer base, with, you know, working with the, with the Phosphorus team. So felt uh, uh, like we'd uh, spread the word on this. So uh, with that, I'm going to jump into the company, uh, company overviews, and then uh, we'll, we'll get into the session today. So for Mobius Partners, uh, again, we've been in business uh, now for 20 years, uh, Texas-based IT solution provider. We call on companies of all sizes from the very largest global-based customers, uh, companies to uh, the smallest, you know, one-person IT shops and any, anything in between uh, and uh, focus on really all industries. There's not a particular vertical we align super well with, we just, everything we do really is a good fit for all types of industries and all sizes of customers. We call ourselves groovers, you know, uh, really this was a, a term that was given, you know, to the founders back during the starting days, but uh, it's really just being passionate about, you know, customer success. And, uh, you know, a big part of that is having some fun along the way. So we like to have some fun along the way. We work really hard. Uh, we do all the intangibles, you know, but, uh, it's really about the success of our customers. Uh, we recently celebrated our 20 year anniversary last October. Uh, something we're very proud of as an organization. You know, there's a stability and reliability speaks volumes uh, to our success. Uh, you know, and, 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 and we get that kind of feedback and have to, have to uh, you know, execute at those levels uh, to continue to be, you know, uh, the partners and serve our customers out there. So yeah, um, from a, a teaming perspective, uh, we get a lot of feedback that we truly are the most talented in the industry. You know, we, we hold countless certifications, uh, receive a lot of recognition from the experts, not only from our technology partners, but also our customers, you know, many times adding, you know, additional expertise above and beyond uh, uh, what the technology partners can provide. So we take pride in that for sure. Uh, Every, every customer we work with you know, supports, uh, uh, every, work, every customer that we work with, we bring a team of individuals to support uh, uh, that customer, whether that's you know, account executives to, to cover sales activities, sales support from an operational, getting those quotes out, getting those statement of works, those proposals, you know, making sure we're finding stuff, getting it shipped on time, 
uh, you know, project management deliverables, bringing, bringing the best in the business to make sure projects are, not only have we sold you the technology or the solution, but we can implement that solution and make sure it becomes a reality, adds a value, and then move on to the next challenge uh, our customers are facing. Uh, along with all that, we bring uh, a team of technology as experts to help, uh, uh, you know, just continue in a number of different technology domains to help, uh, you know, support what you're trying to get done uh, from a business perspective. We're really looking uh, to become just an extension of your team as if we are just employees of your company. We're really just uh, want to establish those long-term relationships and, and help you get things solved and then move on, move on to the next uh, next topic. We say yes a lot. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's not, we have specific areas of expertise that we bring. And, you know, many times we're brought in to help uh, solve a challenge that is, has, that has become very, you know, very difficult in nature. Uh, so we, we many times are brought in to help, uh, you know, get those type of uh, uh, solutions in place, think outside the box and, uh, you know, tailor the service and solution to meet the needs of our customers. Uh, so we take pride a lot in that, you know, even times when we don't really have the expertise helping our customers find someone that can help solve that particular problem that may be out, outside of our reach, uh, but still working as part of the team to, to get things done. Uh, so pretty proud of, uh, you know, just the heritage there and, and really, you know, uh, getting close to our customers. We are a, a minority owned business hub supplier you know, many times that helps with our customers' uh, diversity spends, uh, you know, while at the same time really getting getting the best of the best for the Mobius team. Just quickly on, on what we do, um, we, uh, this will be a quick flyby, flyby, obviously drill down, you know, if you want to get some more information on this uh, or, or continue the dialogue, please reach out to the uh, to the extended Mobius team. Uh, we'd love to, to drill down in any of these areas. Just want to keep it brief here. Uh, but really, when you think about what we do, uh, it's, it's really covering a very broad range of technology solutions and services that we bring to our customer. Uh, we categorize them into four major pillars, digital workspace being really anything outside of the, outside of the data center, edge computing, endpoint uh, type of use cases, remote workforce, uh, all the technologies, the, the processes, uh, the, uh, the, the ongoing care and feeding, the monitoring, the automation, uh, all those types of disciplines uh, exist kind of within that digital workspace outside of the data center solution where the customers in that space, DevOps, DevOps and observability, really adding value throughout the, the the entire IT values chain from managing the demand coming into IT, understanding you know, what services need to be augmented, uh, created, uh, deployed, really uh, uh, engaging throughout that, that uh, CI, CD uh, you know, pipeline process, you know, making sure that uh, uh, we're supporting you know, an agile type of approach and iterative releases and automation and, you know, quality of service and making sure things are up as, as, as much as they can be to meet the business. So really that whole DevOps and kind of monitoring and observability space is a key area for us, service management. Uh, and then just from a workload perspective, we've been solutioning with our customers for 20 years and in the data center, uh, uh, quite, you know, much of that activity is, is evolving and, you know, workloads are, you know, uh, some workloads are good for, uh, a cloud service provider. So we, you know, continue to solution with our customers and, and really help them make decisions on where uh, it makes sense to run their workloads. Uh, a multi-cloud strategy, helping, you know, kind of optimize within the data center, optimize within the cloud uh, to make sure that the, the spend is, uh, matches the business demand and so on. Um, so those are the main, main four pillars. The uh, we wrap everything that we do within those things with, with security and analytics. Um, so on topic today, really IoT security, uh, there's a lot of aspects to that, right? There's the uh, ongoing monitoring, the care and feeding, the, the exposures that we'll talk about today and see a demo of, uh, that's a big piece of it, but also just managing uh, you know, the, the 
the deployment of that, the ongoing updates, um, uh, uh, list goes on and on, how that ties back into the controls uh, within your uh, uh, you know, governance strategy around you know, making sure passwords are rotated and, and all the, the, the hygiene that we need to have within that security environment. Uh, uh, we, we do solution really just across all of the different areas with, with that at Mobius Partners. And uh, I mentioned earlier, we, you know, we are a technology provider, but we also, you know, uh, uh, take pride in making, you know, what is sold to the customer reality. So helping with implementation if it's needed. Um, so we call it that strategic services and uh, they can be anywhere from some canned services we can provide uh, to more more frequently, you know, custom service uh, engagements where, where we're uh, truly looking, you know, mapping to the outcomes of the customer and then uh, working with your team so directly to, to make those a reality and providing expertise where it's needed. And then uh, a super important thing for a lot of customers today is, you know, they don't want to get in the business of IT. They don't want to understand all the, the complexities uh, uh, that are going on. They just want somebody to manage that for us. So uh, all the solutions we can provide them on a project type of basis, but we can also provide them uh, from a managed service perspective and, and uh, you know, get, uh, take over the day-to-day -day operations and do that in a kind of OPEX payment model, uh, if that makes sense. So, so that's a quick, quick flyby uh, on, on Mobius. And at this point, I'm gonna transition over to you, Molly, um, for the phosphorus overview, and uh, I'll let you take it away. I appreciate it. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, Mobius, for putting this together. Um, you can go ahead and, and go to the next slide. Uh, so my name is Molly Marks, and I'm responsible for business in the Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Arkansas region. And I've been with Phosphorus for a little over a year. And I'm gonna, I have two slides, and I'm going to keep it very brief because um, Chris really uh, has some great content to share as well, well as Dave. Um, I, just a little, I, I wanted to provide a little understanding of, of um, who we are so that you have an idea of why Chris has the expertise and knowledge that he has around embedded devices. And um, so this is the fourth startup for our co-founders. Chris and Earl have actually been working together for uh, a couple of decades. Um, and they, they really, when they start a company, it starts with finding, you know, realizing that there's a problem and providing a solution for that problem. So with Phosphorus, it started as a notion of, well, there's not really good tooling out there today for IoT. Um, you can't patch them, you can't manage them well. Um, and this was a conversation that started back in 2017. So they, they decided, you know, let's do something about that. Um, but they needed to answer two questions first. One, can they provide a solution that is scalable because there are millions of IoT devices? And the second one is that, can they do it agentlessly? When they answered those two questions, Phosphorus was formed. Um, it started out with um, patching. So they, were, they built a product that could automatically patch IoT devices. And our uh, first few customers said, wow, this is awesome. We love it. Um, what can you do about credentials on these devices? And they said, well, let us see. And then they answered those same two questions. Can we do this at scale? And can we do it agentlessly for credentials as well? And the answer was yes. And that really is uh, what formed Phosphorus Cybersecurity. So um, Scott, if you can go to the next slide. So what, what Phosphorus Security is, is it's a tool that is focused on um, embedded devices. So we recognize that there are a lot of network asset tools out there to get, that gives you visibility across your network. Um, but there was a gap when it came to IP embedded devices. And that's really what Phosphorus addresses. So we're able to detect, patch, and update vulnerable IoT firmware. Um, we can also take data from those um, existing vulnerability or network asset, asset tools and enrich that data and enroll them in a lifecycle management um, for your embedded devices. Um, we also, with our product, you can force uh, IoT compliance um, with device remediation and policies around these devices that really haven't been um, easy to do in the past. 
Uh, so we work with, we're, you know, a company with very little technology debt, really no technology debt. So um, we've built a lightweight, or our founders have built a lightweight solution that works with just about any product out there. Um, your PAM tools, the network access tools, um, you name it. The other piece that um, is equally important is default and weak passwords. So again, um, we can detect uh, all your IoT devices, and then also detect that they have default credentials or weak passwords, maybe passwords that were initially used five years ago, and it might be admin one. Um, we can de detect those passwords and then enroll it uh, in your existing CAM solution. And if you don't have one, we also um, provide an existing CAM solution or a PAM solution within our tool. So really with Phosphorus, we're addressing all those embedded devices that are, are driving growth in a lot of organizations and, and, um, and allowing you to now manage them with a tool that not only provides visibility, but also gives you that extra power of automating the remediation of those devices. And what we found with our customers is that remediation uh, typically happened manually or not at all, or not very often. So um, we're pretty excited about this product. Uh, the response from companies and customers has been amazing. And, and I think it's because Chris and Earl set out to solve a problem and they really did that with Phosphorus. So with that said, I wanna pass it over to Chris Ruland. Um, Chris has been in the information security business for over 25 years. Um, again, this is his fourth startup. He speaks, you know, he's a speaker at a lot of big um, information security engagements and events, and um, I'm excited to pass it over to him and have him walk you through what he's learned after interrogating a million uh, of these devices that I've been talking about. So, Chris. Um, great. Thanks, Scott uh, and Molly and Mobius. Uh, we really appreciate you hosting this event and kind of uh, letting us uh, share some information that we've learned that now that we've got about a million devices uh, under management. Um, and we've learned some surprising things and we've also learned some things that we expected to be bad, but we, we, we didn't actually know how bad they were. And really most people don't know how bad things are because uh, most traditional vulnerability assessment platforms aren't doing an effective job on identifying embedded devices. And so um, it's really exciting to see this crazy idea come to life. So when I look at an IoT device, this is what I look at. This is one line of JSON uh, out of uh, uh, Rumble, which we embed in our product um, for discovery. Um, and in this case, this is a Cisco um, CP8865 phone. And the, um, you can tell a couple things here. One is it's running SSH. Another is it's got both Wi-Fi and Ethernet interfaces on it, which is a common issue we see on embedded devices in IoT that really bypasses the concept of VLANs when you've got multiple protocol stacks and multiple network interfaces. It also presents some interesting challenges when we deal with the, um, the fact that IoT moves not only physically, but logically across the network. And so when, when this Cisco phone gets deployed someplace else in your company over Wi-Fi, we have to still be able to find that device um, and re recognize it regardless of the IP address or MAC address. Um, so in this case, you can see Cisco nicely gives up the serial number for the phone, which is a pretty, pr pretty good um, uh, piece of data to uniquely identify it. But we go quite a bit deeper than that. Um, so the this is a... Uh, a study from the University of Wisconsin. And when I read this in, at the end of 2016, um, I started the company. Um, we incorporated in 2017. And so this scatter graph is a measurement of a DDoS attack against US from 2003 to 2016. And like a good university, as opposed to stopping the attack, they just measured it for 13 years. And what you can see here is the decay rate and half-life is tremendously long if you put it in context of a traditional, say, desktop computer. Um, and it, it truly reflects what we see in the enterprise. Enterprise is really about worse. We actually see um, about a seven-year half-life um, on firmware in enterprise IoT. 
So after looking at a million lines of this, these are some of the headlines we found. This one surprised us. The, and we typically find around 20% of a network or three to four devices per employee is a good, um, good uh, measurement of the number of embedded devices in a corporation. That's when you factor in every printer, every badge reader, every thermostat, every HVAC system, every train chiller, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now that we've got this large enough sample set, these inferences um, really apply to everybody. So you probably have, so 20% of your, your network is IoT and 26% of that 20% is um, end of life. You've got 5.2% of your network that's EOL that you probably don't know about. So that's something, for instance, we roll that up into service now, we'll get the EOL date, CISO can decide to accept the risk or replace the device. Uh, probably the most common thing we see is uh, HP printers that are end of life because the, the, the older HP printers, as my co-founder likes to say, are like good old pickup trucks. They just keep running as long as you keep feeding them paper and toner. And so you can choose to accept the risks uh, if there are vulnerabilities there or you can, you can replace them. This one, like I really wasn't expecting this in the enterprise. Um, half of these devices have default credentials. So 10% of your network has default credentials. Um, if we're saying 50% of 20%. Um, and, and that's just a remarkable fail. And I think the reason for that is that the auditors are not picking up on these devices because they don't have the tools to find them. And therefore the visibility is not being rolled up to the CISO or CTO. And so when we, we deploy, do a POV, get it going like a day or so, um, it really lights up like a Christmas tree. And, and we, had, we had a deployment where the, uh, the door controller for the entire campus, the password was Tyco Tyco, and we can unlock 6,400 doors because they've made this huge investment in physical security, but no one changed the password on the door controllers. So it, it's, um, it obviously it's an easy fix. There's there are honestly some technical challenges around the credential management that we can talk about in the demo um, because we, we obviously can't depend on DHCP addresses, IP addresses or MAC addresses. Um, and so actually the, the computer science behind um, managing credentials on a device that can logically and physically move was, a, was probably our hardest problem to solve. And then we, we, we um, do not store those credentials. Those credentials are stored in, in, uh, in a vault. So half of that, again, so 10% of your network has CVEs um, in it, um, which is, you know, not surprising if this, the half-life on the firmware is seven years old. Um, not surprising half of that's got vulnerabilities. This was the biggest surprise to me that 18% out of a million, so 180,000 devices had, had CVEs of nine or above. And in most organizations, if there's a critical CVE, we kind of get off the phone and fix it immediately. <laughs> it's like a stop, drop, and roll exercise. And um, so, you know, if you're looking at 18% of 20%, so um, I don't know, what's that? 3.6% of your network has, has critical CVEs on it per, per, per my numbers. Um, and so we'll see things like camera systems that, you know, have eight-year-old firmware on them with lots of CVEs and but really because they've been managed by different parts of the organization um, and, and the security team hasn't been able to extract the vulnerability data out of those devices because the tooling hasn't been available. So this was, this, this was a shocker and we're, we're really excited that we can automate and solve this problem for our customers. So I've expanded my top 10, I think. But this is one of my personal favorites. So uh, at KVMs in general, specifically as Avacent K KVM is spectacular in that uh, this one, this model here, the 5010s uh, controls uh, up to 64 servers. Um, most of the Avacents, so this actually runs a full stack Ubuntu Linux inside the KVM. And it's running Ubuntu 10, okay? I don't even know how old that is, but the oxymoron is the machine that has its virtual 
uh, video, keyboard, and mouse controlling all your most important assets is vulnerable, probably the most vulnerable. Um, so it's, it's remarkable. The, the, the device's passwords don't get changed on these, and they certainly no one thinks about patching them because everyone thinks it's just a switch when it's really a full stack Linux box. Um, another one I like that we put some effort into, actually a um, guy from LinkedIn asked us to do this. Um, and um, uh, this is a big challenge across the board. The um, out-of-band management controllers, that, so that little card right there um, is really another real-time OS or embedded Linux or BusyBox uh, you know, whether it's a uh, Dell IDRAC, a HP ILO, or a Supermicro IPMI, they all run their own little embedded um, uh, OS for uh, remote management and out-of-band management. Um, however, no one thinks about patching that part of the server, which is really just as important as patching the server itself. Um, additionally, there is malware that is propagating for these, these um, out-of-band management controllers. And we've seen it show up in, in bare metal cloud systems where, you know, someone put some malware on, on the servers and the next person who rented them, um, you know, ended up having um, unsecured uh, out-of-band management controllers and was rooted that way. So no one considers these. I've not met anybody who really has a program for, for, for managing the firmware credentials on these things. So we, we basically support them all going back to the first ILO up to the most, most current. Um, Another one, and that's, I've got this thing behind me. Um, it's actually months full of stuff too. Um, are the, um, the, the racks. And so one component of a rack I mentioned was um, obviously the KVM. Um, and there are many vendors of KVM. They, they all kind of suffer from similar issues of, of um, you know, being, being left uh, uncared for and unfed, as Scott said. And, um, uh, but really, uh, like this rack behind me, this APC Smart Rack, has six network interfaces in it. It's got interfaces for the fan controllers. It's got interfaces for the PDUs. It's got interfaces for the UPS. Um, it's got a generic interface for just overall rack health statistics and temperature. And um, all those run different pieces of, in this case, APC firmware. And there are vulnerabilities in those. There are credentials on those. However, typically once the racks are set up, they're ignored. And, and I've heard problems with this in, in the data centers of the biggest cloud companies in the world have this problem as well. And I think most people have a problem where they're actually not managing the security of the racks themselves, which can you know, lead to different points of ingress and pivot. So I mentioned this, uh, Tyco iStar Ultra. Uh, that was the, the one we found, where we find these all the time now, um, uh, th that allowed us to open doors. And so this is always a big eye opener when we find these in customers. We probably see them in about half our customers and there are some other vendors that we support as well. But this, this software house stuff is definitely the most popular. And not only they have vulnerabilities, but um, they've got uh, default credentials. Um, they also have some weird characteristics like that one with the lock on it. You can't, can't do things to it unless the lock is open and actually holds down a dip switch. So it's really some kind of bizarre cyber physical system features that, you know, if you're thinking about IoT, you'd probably not consider this to be IoT, but we call it IoT because it's a connected thing. And it's important. So like getting into like the really big groups, printers, printers are in horrendous shape. Um, We've not seen anybody who has uniform credential management or uniform firmware management on printers. And if you recall Black Hat 2019, um, Black Hat 2019, uh, some vulnerability researchers uh, announced vulnerabilities in 19,000 unique printer models. And we're like, wow, well, this is a, this is a good test for phosphorus. How, how are we gonna do this? And the, the reason we're successful in doing this is we spent two years building an abstraction layer so that, um, we don't actually need to, to acquire every single printer to test in our lab. Um, in, the, in the case of say Hewlett Packard, over the last 30 years, the LaserJet family in all the firmwares across the multifunction printers um, really breaks down into three sets of firmware. And that covers about 5,000 unique HP printer models. 
So we use a genus and species model and say, hey, Hewlett Packard has three families of firmware. We need to cover this. So we cover every HP printer ever made with 300 lines of code. Uh, and we knew that if we had to write a line of code for every new device, that we, this would be a fool's errand because of the, the quantity. But we get massive leverage by, by, by using this genus and species model. So with the, for the Kyoceras, Epsons, et cetera, you know, probably 500 lines of code allowed us to uh, offer protection and support for those, um, I think it was 19,000 printers models uh, that were disclosed in um, 2019 Black Hat. Um, these, I've got one of these next to me. I love these things. Sometimes they're running Android. Sometimes they're running Linux. Um, uh, the, uh, I'm picking on Cisco, but um, Crestron's worse. Um, I'll tell you, it's, people are shocked when, when we flag uh, critical CVEs and these and then Crestrons or, you know, why is my phone running an SSH server with default credentials on it? And um, it's also in the case of VoIP phones, um, there's a, we kind of expected this to be a solved problem with uh, Cisco Call Manager. However, there's a leakage problem um, in that Cisco Call Manager, pretty much across the board, we find has abandoned about 10% of the phones in most enterprises. And we were kind of shocked, like why are, so if you have 30,000 know, 30, employees, 30,000 phones, we're just saying, why are 3,000 phones like all on different firmwares and 27,000 are, 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 are safe? And that's because uh, call managers somehow lost um, those devices. And so it's important to have a double check um, to find those vulnerable devices. Um, and then where you're looking at Cisco VTC, I mean, it's, it's basically a, a, an iMac inside there, uh, except you can run Linux or Android on it. So I, 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 I love playing around with the one I have here. Right now, I've got a, I've got a, a, a set-top box from a, a hospitality company uh, plugged into it that we're looking for vulnerabilities in. Um, so this is one, the EDS 1100. We've seen this in every single customer at least one of these things. Um, and we've never seen a password set on it. They're controlling important serial devices, usually in a data center, no passwords, no firmware updates. It, you know, it doesn't look like a computer. You will think of it as a computer. The, the EDS 2100, the next version of this actually runs a full, I think this is like a busy box or something. The EDS 2100, which is a newer version of this actually runs full, a full Linux box inside there. So this is just as much a vulnerability to your enterprise as a vulnerable server could be. Um, it also has a mode to, to allow you to start sniffing packets. You just log into it and turn it on and it'll sniff packets for you. So it's pretty crazy. Um, uh, this is a trained chiller. Uh, we see chillers in, in most of our uh, customers who have some, some kind of data center facility. Um, they, these usually speak BACnet. Uh, building X control net protocols, um, but they also, you know, they're listing on SSH, they're running firmware, people don't think about patching them, you know, a lot of times they're leased or someone else manages them, but at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter who actually owns that device, if it's plugged into your network and you're responsible for the security of your network, you've got to make sure your critical pieces of infrastructure are patched, and if you recall the, the, the target uh, exploit, the pivot was off the HVAC system. And so we see these are commonly ignored. BACnet is a very friendly protocol, meaning that it gives a lot of information about what the device is, what firmware it's running, et cetera. Um, so um, for an attacker, it's very easy to fingerprint these. If you just go into Shodan, type in train chiller, you'll be shocked at what you see um, because you'll see many of them exposed to the open internet. So we see a lot of these, um, probably half our accounts, we'll see something like this with vulnerabilities. Um, by far the worst offenders are the cameras. And that itself is also a bit of an oxymoron in that the security things, devices that are supposed to be providing physical security um, were the backbone of the Mirai botnet, which was powerful enough to shut down Twitter for 24 hours. <laughs> um, and um, we see this across the board, all of our customers, um, do not manage the security of these devices. And again, these are just little Linux boxes that look like a camera. And um, they carry with them a lot of vulnerabilities. And again, 
these are typically multi-protocol. So a concept of VLANs um, isn't entirely effective when you've got something that's got Bluetooth, it's got Wi-Fi 2.4, maybe it's got Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6, and then it's got Ethernet on it. So you've got multiple vectors. Once you get an implant on one of these, you can start turning on other network interfaces and uh, cause all kinds of mayhem. And so again, across the board, like it's, it's shocking in the most sophisticated financial services and biggest financial services organizations in the world, they're running seven to 10 year old software on their cameras with two to three critical CVEs. Um, and Molly, I think just went through that slide with you. So that's kind of it for my pitch. I would love um, to take some Q and A now, uh, and then we can show you what we actually do about it. Do we, do we have any questions out there for Chris at this point or? I was gonna just uh, 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 kick one off here, Chris, from the standpoint of, of uh, the devices uh, you talked about, you know, uh, some, some coding necessary to support the, you know, ridiculous amounts of printers that HP has put out there, right? Uh, uh, one, one question I'm sure customers would have is, is the challenges they're facing is, how, how, what is supported today? You know, how do yeah. you adopt new technology? Could you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Like, it, because if you try and support every IoT device made in the planet, you, you'll never be able to do it. But what we experience, what we're experiencing is a network effect and that our first deployment in 2019, we had a 60% uh, supported device detection rate. And at this point, we're usually in the, the uh, in the nineties. Uh, always been 90% or above. There are always be like one or two, like, so for instance, trading floors, we found the atomic clocks on their network that to sync trades. And, you know, we, we hadn't thought about that. And so we, you know, added one of those. Um, uh, and so we'll typically find in a proof of concept, there might be one or two devices that aren't supported. Uh, the level of effort for us because of our abstraction layer um, is a junior engineer can, can add support for a new device family um, so a good example would be a Vigilon camera. So Vigilon is a nice high-end uh, security camera. Um, they have several hundred models of camera. Um, we added support for every a Vigilon camera ever made in about two days with 100 lines of code. So it's something on the order of writing a snort or a message signature for us due to abstraction. And I think down the road, that's something we'll, we'll be sharing with partners, potentially customers, so we can provide their own device support, not unlike a snort or a message model. So it sounds like fairly, very, very, yeah, not too difficult of a lift to add new device support to there. It is not. It's not, it's not a difficult lift. Yeah. It's actually we. I do it myself, and and and, and, and because it's fun, uh, and um, it's fun learning about new devices and the just the strange and weird things that are on computer networks, and they're <laughs> usually pretty soft targets to 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 find vulnerabilities in as well. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, we're right now. You know, I was th this year, every every deal we've done, we've on our first rollout, we've clocked in the 90% supported range, which is pretty strong. Uh, Qu uh, Qualys, Tenable, and Rapid7 have at about a 10% detection rate. So keep in mind, not only are we detecting these things, we're actually remediating them. Um, and uh, so Gartner actually calls this the Tanium of IoT, which is a comp I'll take. <laughs> That's great. I know that we, uh, uh, I think we are transitioning to a demo here. So I wanted to, to give a, uh, have enough time to, to kind of walk through a, a couple demo use cases. So it might be a good time to transition to that. Great. Yeah, let's, unless there are any questions you want to throw in chat. Don't see anything yet, Chris. So uh, uh, okay. we transition to the demo. Yeah, Dave, Dave, you want to take over? Yep, bringing up the demo right now. Hopefully, hopefully everybody can see the screen. Yeah. Good, Chris. Yeah. Good. Good. So when when Chris talks about how he sees IoT devices, um, you know, I think this this screen here is is how the rest of us see <laughs> all the IoT devices. This is the main look of our console. So as we do um, a scan across the network to to pull in the devices, we're pulling them into the console. 
Uh, and as we're scanning and, and bringing them in, like I think Molly had brought up the fact that we can actually auto uh, add the, uh, the devices into a credential provider. So either through the, the local vault or another PAM provider, we can do that pretty, pretty easily. So um, as we look at these devices, I'll, I'll give you an example. So here's some of the data that we're actually pulling back. So, you know, again, a lot of tools are going to find things and they'll say, oh, here's this device. We think it's Linux. Maybe it's a camera. We see some header that looks like access. So it could be a camera. For us specifically, we're going to give you exactly what that device is. So we're giving you the model number, not just a, a maybe. It's an exact access camera with, you know, the Q3505. Uh, we're pulling not only just an IP and a Mac, but we're also pulling information. We can pull serial numbers, um, model numbers, part numbers, all that information. And then from there, we're, we're gathering things like uh, we had talked about the, the default credentials. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're pulling those default credentials off the device. So, you know, you have a good idea of what is vulnerable and what isn't. But not only that, when we pull information like the firmware, you know, we're telling you exactly what version of firmware, but if you look here on the side, um, you know, currently this one has, you know, it's probably a, a just out of the box firmware edition that, it, that you'll see anytime you pull something out, right? So a lot of times these devices come out, maybe they don't tell you you need to update the firmware, but what we're doing is we're actually giving you, hey, currently the firmware this device is actually running, you know, this it's this version. I mean, if you see, it's got the release date, so you can see that it's a, it's an old version. And then not only that, but also all the, the CVEs that are applied to that. So like Chris said, the most vulnerable devices in your network, you know, they're showing up with these critical CVEs right out of the box. So as you go through these, the, the different versions of firmware, because you need to update them to the most, you know, either the most current or maybe a previous version, depending on your environment, you know, each one of these uh, firmware updates that we put in here, we're going to show you the the rundown of anything that's that's been um, known to be vulnerable so gives you a good idea if you want to upgrade to this version it's it's a pretty clean version so looking at the alerts over on the left again default credentials super important um discontinued devices this is another thing that chris talked about is a lot of the devices on your network you know they're just they've been there for so long maybe we forgot about them or the person that managed them is gone um, but we're giving you that information as well, uh, and then the firmware, and then any vulnerabilities. So once we have all that information, you know, again, what do we do about it, right? So just I'll use this device as an example. It's it's really as easy as as clicking a button and rotating a password. So I hit rotate a password, rotate that device now has a new password, and you know, and again. Using your PAM tool, you can schedule these updates, so you're actually getting into into you know the the one of the most important things that you can have is these devices sitting there. We're rotating them on a, the passwords on a on a on a some sort of regular basis. So as we you know look at the pipeline incident that happened, right, a rotated credential just it never got rotated. So this is going to ensure that those things are happening. So when we take all this information, um, you know, here's a, a good example of a, a, an executive dashboard where we're giving you your entire environment, and then we're using the filters to show you kind of exactly where your vulnerabilities exist. So what's important first? Okay, I got, you know, most of my devices are going to have default credentials. So maybe I want to click on that, and now I can see every single one of my devices that has specifically a default credential problem. Uh, and again, and one thing we also we also cover is the unique insider threat that affects IoT in that anyone with a paperclip can can reset the firmware and password on any device. And so when we notice that has happened, the device has changed the credentials or changed the firmware and that we didn't do it, we immediately track triggered insider threat alert and roll that up to your SIM. Okay, and we'll just kind of jump down into the security overview as well. So, you know, again, matching up to what Chris was talking about, you know, what are what are the most uh, the, the most critical things that are affecting my network? Here's a great uh, example of that, right? So your default credentials, um, you know, this is a small demo environment, but you, these numbers remain the same as you multiply out. Um, again, the default credentials, the CVEs, uh, you know, and as we go down through, we're kind of giving we're giving you that real granular data to not only 
the, the specifics like, okay, I've got default credentials, but how many of my IP cameras are affected or, or my printers? Uh, and again, these numbers are pretty, pretty consistent as you multiply an environment out. And then as we kind of look down through here, again, the out-of-date firmware, uh, again, just a really good idea of what's going on in the network. So I know I only had 10 minutes. I mean, I, I want to be conscious of the time. Are there more questions we want to get to or? I don't think we have any questions out there, Dave. Um, one of the things I was just going to ask is as, uh, you know, as, as customers engage, um, obviously there's probably a number of different device types that may be top of mind for them. Many of them may be in the list here. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, you know, the assessment you guys offer? I think it's a, a short engagement, do some discovery, uh, you know, kind of figure out, you know, number of devices, that type of thing. Could you just talk, uh, walk through that, Dave? Sure. So you, you're talking about like a, a POV process where we're, where we're coming in to do an assessment. Um, typically, it's a, it's a very quick process. I mean, I've, I've been doing this for um, a long time. I, I worked for a, a large defense contractor for about 20 years. Um, and I can tell you that from a, 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 an assessment perspective, you know, we look to get about, uh, you know, about 2,000 devices. It gives us a really good, uh, you know, kind of maybe a problem area that you have, specifically printers, those kind of things. So we, we get that information. Um, we do a scan uh, of your environment. And usually within a couple of hours, we're, we're actually showing you what you're looking at, where we're showing you, um, you know, again, your environment here, you know, we're, we're displaying it, we're showing you the alerts. We've got support, like Chris said, over 90% of the devices that, you know, are in typical environments. So we have a pretty good picture within a few hours of, of scanning uh, the network. So um, to pretty, like I said, it's a pretty easy process. It's a, it's a, you know, we deliver an OVA file to you and, and off we go. Oh, that's awesome. You want to add anything to that, Chris? We... No, that's spot on, man. Um, we 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 would love uh, to be able to show you guys, um, you know, what what your exposure looks like. So we've seen the we've seen the ability to obviously the passwords is is huge out there, right? And then obviously the firmware. Uh, could you, Chris or Dave, could you talk to, you know, like what's coming? I know, I think you guys have. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe, so yeah, I know that there's some things you can't share, right? But, but uh, no, no, we, we talk so about what you guys are thinking. Yeah. The, so a couple big, big initiatives we have. One is um, um, uh, device hardening. So that um, in addition to just uh, patching with the current firmware and rotating credentials, we're, we're hardening devices. So mo most of these devices are running on encrypted port 80. A lot of them run Telnet, a lot of them running SSH, they don't need to be. Um, and so basically doing some basic hygiene to, to cut down on those services, maybe disable the network interfaces that are unnecessary. Um, that's one big one. Another big one is initiative is around 5G support. Um, we're doing work in San Antonio on that. And then um, finally, I'd say it's um, uh, moving to a, a cloud model. Um, so our initial deployments were mostly DOD and financial services, and those customers prefer a on-prem deployment. And having done several startups, we know the, the cloud debate is not one you want to have out of the box when you're trying to get feedback from customers. And so this runs completely on-prem, does not send data back to the cloud. Um, but for more for opportunities for small and medium businesses, we think a cloud offering is, you know, just with a self-service model is, is probably the way to go. So, yeah, I mean, device hardening and configuration management on top of that, the um, uh, 5G support and a cloud voice place deployment model are all on the roadmap for this year. Yeah, all those uh, important features, yeah, I can't really... Yeah, change and config is a huge issue. So just getting some visibility into that, right, Chris, uh, uh, is going to be game changing. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, above, the, Cisco you know, just, yeah. the Cisco phones are a great example. You know, they should all be have the same configuration, but somehow they don't. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and then the, the Cisco phones are probably the best. Uh, it's all downhill from there. 
Um, and, and, and so getting a, a standard configuration deployed across all your devices is just, just something you would do for your servers. And the bottom line is all these things are little servers and, and um, nobody's really built the tooling or treated them as such. Um, and, you know, we saw that no one had this capability and the number of IoT devices certainly exceeds the number of personal computers in the world today. So it's a, it's a very large total addressable market space. It really is impacting, you know, companies of all sizes. Uh, I, I think, you know, maybe a little manageable for some that are that are small that don't have a lot of these devices, but, you know, for, for most companies. You know, we're, so we can downgrade it just as easily upgrade. So if there's another, another solar wind situation that affects firmware on embedded devices, you can immediately roll back. Um, um, and additionally, different, um, different embedded devices have different um, password strengths. The worst case is a four digit numeric pin. Best case is, you know, 20 digit uh, alphanumeric special characters. We understand the password rules for these devices and we then feed the PAM tool the, those, those parameters so it can generate the strongest possible password for the device. Yeah, it's huge. You know, we talked a lot about the discover and analyze and you were nailing the, the remediation side of this, right? Uh, that not only can you find it and let you know what the issues are, but you can fix it, you know, and that's where a lot, yeah. of, it, a lot of the solutions days fall down. Yeah. Like, yeah, they got an issue here, but go, you know, uh, it's going to take to do that a hundred thousand times. is going to take a lot of time. Right. So it, 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 it just make, yeah, it makes it even more complex. You guys really address this head on. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, our estimate is, uh, is to do this manually. It takes up, would take a couple of hours per device per year. So if, if mm -hmm. you know twenty percent of your network's IoT that's someone manually, it's probably a whole team of people doing this manually. Um, we we only only believe in actionable data. Uh, something telling us, oh, it's an HP printer, but we don't know what model it is. It's pretty useless to us. Um, we so we need actionable data, and we built this company foundationally, knowing that we didn't want to give anyone any more work. We wanted to uh, automate the work for them. Um, so people, people see this and they can just, you know, select the devices they want to secure and secure them. Um, and a lot of times there's coordination required with the, the actual business, you know, that owns the devices, right? If, if it's the security team, physical security guys who own the cameras or uh, a third party vendor who owns all the multifunction printers, ultimately, if those things get hacked and are used as a pivot to compromise your network, you know, it's the CISO's responsibility. And uh, I think a lot of analysts and investors asked us, they said, oh, well, no one's gonna, no one's gonna patch this because they're gonna be too scared to. And I've not run, I've not run into a single deployment where when we lit them up with a couple thousand critical CVEs, they didn't wanna go solve that problem. And we make it easy to click. All right, folks, really appreciate you listening in today. You know, uh, happy to continue the dialogue on the topic with, uh, you know, reach out to Mobius, the Phosphorus team. Uh, uh, obviously take advantage. We talked a little bit about the assessment, you know, uh, reach out, uh, learn more about that. An easy way to get a, a good understanding of where you do stand today, right? And, and validate that uh, you are in good shape or maybe have some gaps in the strategy. Uh, this is a, uh, solution space that's really been untapped and phosphorus it's early to market with this stuff and and uh you know uh, as far as just integrating it in with your existing tools or using this tool you know to, to solve the problem uh got you covered from that perspective so uh, again thanks for joining today hope you found the time valuable 